Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video. Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched Only Yesterday. Hi, this is Nikki. This is John, and thank you for joining us at 1991 Movie Rewind. Only Yesterday follows Taiko, a woman in her late 20s, as she takes a summer vacation away from her corporate job in Tokyo to work in a farm picking safflowers. The trip triggers a lot of memories of her childhood, causing her to frequently flash back to a very eventful fifth grade year. Screenplay by Isao Takahata, directed by Isao Takahata, and released in Japan on July 20th, 1991. I don't think I have to ask, but uh, <laughs> you have not seen Only Yesterday before. No, I did not yeah. see this. I haven't seen this. Uh, most people have not. I had not either. Um, and that's because it was not released in the U.S. until 2016, for the most part. But was it released in the theaters, or was it... It was released in the theaters in 2016, yes. Okay. Um, so in July 20th, 1991, in Japan... Huge box office success. It was actually the highest grossing domestic film in Japan in 1991 with 1.87 billion yen. But it was not released domestically for the U.S. audiences, I'm saying domestic. Um, From what I could tell, the only U.S. release prior to the theatrical 2016 thing was Turner Classic Movies showed the subtitled version once as part of like a Studio Ghibli retrospective. Huh. In like 2000 something, like 8 or 9. Mm. Maybe 05, 06. I didn't write that down. Somewhere in the mid 2000s they did it. So still, it took a long time for it to, to over to the West here. Um, but now the Studio Ghibli library is complete for American audiences to watch. Yeah. And this is worth watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I think it's another example of how like the the summary can be kind of tough to really explain all the nuances of the film. This is very, it, it's a very subtle movie, in my opinion, um, because you're you're. It's a lot about the character development, so you see this woman, Tycho, as a fifth grader in 1966, so she's what like 11 years old or so. 11, 12 years old. And then you see her as an adult, 27 year old in 1982. And it's like, not only a coming of age story of her as a fifth grader, but also as like a 27 year old. Yeah. Like like she's finding herself multiple times throughout this movie. And and like the flashbacks help her do that. I mean, it starts off where she's on the phone with her sister because, you know, her sister is like saying, do you want this is I was kind of confused because she stays at her brother-in-law's place. But was her sister even there? No, I don't think she was. That's where I was getting a little confused. Yeah, they don't. They don't fully explain the relationship, but the farm that she goes to is, is owned by like her, her brother-in-law's family. Something, yeah, family. So it's not it's not the brother-in-law that's there. It's like someone who is related to the brother-in-law, like a cousin or something like that. Yeah, the guy that it's, yeah, like multiple she layers meets of up relatives. With, that's her brother-in-law's second cousin. Yes. So then I like the family she stays with. That's her sister her older sister's husband's family yes yeah in some yes in some, in for, some way for, but then i they don't w- fully get into the relationship <clears throat> but i was it. thinking like but where's the sister so the sister didn't come out to like meet up with her no that's where i was like okay she's gonna go out there and not like meet up with her sister but her sister's husband and his family i don't know if the sister's husband was there either 
Oh, so it was just his family that yeah. was kind of hosting her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah they, <laughs> That's I got confused <laughs> for like in the beginning cuz you're introduced to all these like there's a million different characters. There's a lot of characters <laughs> thrown at you at once. Mm -hmm. And they throw the different timelines at you pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a little bit to get your bearings as to who is who. Yeah, what, yeah. What's what. Um, I tried to do my best to like write down the names of characters as they showed up and as they were introduced. But I, I'm sure I missed some. Because um, it can be really tough to track who is which. Like I don't even remember which sister... It was that had the farm relation. It was either what was it like, uh, the Nanako or Yaiko. I don't know which one. <laughs> like I, I don't yeah, know which I of those two don't, sisters. I still is the don't one. know because Taiko, she's the youngest of three. She's the youngest of three. Yeah. And I didn't know if it was you know because she had like her sisters seemed like they were much older than her. They didn't really say like what the age did difference was yeah not exactly yeah so taiko was in fifth grade in 1966 at that time yaiko was in high school i don't remember if they said exactly which year and then nanako was in college she yeah. was an art student in college so they explained that much there's at yeah least, they, but they didn't yeah so, so they probably four or five to eight years difference right from top to bottom which is significant um but yeah they don't show up in the modern day story at all Except, no. to, except for like through that phone call, and I don't know if you even hear their voice in that. Maybe you do. No, you do because you do? Okay. it's them going back and forth talking about her like not being married, and she's twenty seven, and you know. Yeah, and they want to set her up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but Tycho is a very like independent person. Yes. Who doesn't want. She doesn't want to be forced to do things that she doesn't think of herself, in essence. So right, she's yeah, she's a very independent woman. <laughs> sort of break break from convention. Yes. And this isn't from so much... the '60s where she what where they go in the past. Yeah. Where how their family life was with like her mom, like you know, because they show her mom and dad. They don't really show what like her dad did. But pretty Just much some sort of biz, traveling businessman or something. Yeah, but yeah. pretty much the mom did everything in the house, and then the dad would just sit down, and then you know food would be brought to him, mm -hmm. and he's just sitting there like smoking cigarettes. Yeah, very and demanding. <laughs> very yeah, and says like one sentence in the I don't know like in the entire movie I don't know he like barely speaks in yeah. the movie or to his family. Or anything, yeah. Yeah, very, very few words. Uh, the words that you say are impactful, but... Um, right, yeah. He'll just tell people to, you know... But, yeah. Settle down. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, we'll be quiet. Clear, clear patriarch to do what she wants to do, which is get away from the city. Really, because... Even as a little kid, she had always grown up in Tokyo. She wanted to go on those summer vacations, like, to the country, because that's what her friends were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. And none of her family wanted to do that. Um, they arranged for that trip, like, when she was, you know, in fifth grade. Um, and only the grandma went, because, you know, like, none of, like, the mother needed to stay there, and the father was working... Um, and the sisters just didn't want to. Yeah. And so it's just her and her grandmother going to this, uh, this countryside town and they toured a whole bunch of like Roman bath type places Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as their vacation, which is a weird thing. Uh, Onoya is the, the, or no, Atami. Atami is what they went, where they went to. So, um, but she had always been fascinated with the country. Mm -hmm. And so now, when she's taking vacations from her job in Tokyo, she wants to go to the country and, like, work as a farmhand. And so she's there and she's, like, ready to work and, like, you know, studies up on it and, like, yeah. wants to fully immerse herself in farm life. Something that I thought was really interesting, as she's traveling by train to the farm, yeah, that's about a third of the way through the movie, I think. 
ultimately. Up until this point, we've had a lot of different flashbacks of key events in her fifth grade life, which maybe we'll get into more as we go through this. But on the train specifically, her fifth grade self is there on the train with her. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was going to be something that kind of carried over throughout the whole course of the movie. And she even says it in the narration that like, that that version of her was coming along on the trip like you know sort of yeah. like a, as like a physical person um and she really disappears in that one little shot and then uh that's it and then it just goes back into flashbacks and present day flashback present day structure again so it was interesting i was kind of expecting them to i was expecting her to interact like and have a dialogue with her younger self at some um, point. And that didn't okay. happen. I just thought, I mean, that was just kind of... Not, I don't want to say a ghost, but... And her, it, her younger soul was with there. Like, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was clearly more metaphorical. Yeah. But because it only happened that one little time, it mm. was a little odd and I was sort of wondering is this going to happen again is this you know going to continue and it really doesn't until like at the very yeah, at very the end. very end it ha so when she's on the train again so the, I don't getting know, ready yeah. to go back home yeah yeah it happens again what i'd like to talk about before we get into this is, okay so studio ghibli but it's much different than a lot of the studio ghibli movies that probably a lot of listeners are, are used to i would say yeah, because, um, yeah, there, this is... Not fantasy. Yeah, that's what, yeah, it's not very fantasy. Right, it's not, it, it's not, like, based on any sort of, like, fable, it's not based on folklore or anything like that, there's no mysticism, there's no spirituality yeah, in that a, way. Yeah, this is just a simple story about No talking animals. Yeah, it's right. extremely grounded in reality. It's, it's probably the most realistic, um... I mean, yeah. In terms of until, subject matter. That yeah, you'll, that until you're find. like maybe you get to like the wind rises and stuff like that. I was yeah. Like that's I was trying to think of like what other movie. I mean, you can't. That's a different story, but I mean, that's that also isn't very fantasy. Right. Now I will say that okay, th this is coming from Takahata, right? Instead of instead of uh, Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. um, Miyazaki produced. Um, but Takahata directed, uh, and he did, uh, Pompoko and the tale of Princess Kaguya, which is again, more sort of like grounded yeah. in reality a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then one that I have not seen at all, which may completely throw this theory out of the window is Grave of the Fireflies. Oh, well, yeah. Grave of the Fireflies. That's also... But very that's, much real life. Yeah, that's real and life. And it's based on that's, real events, I believe. Right? Yeah, it's about yeah. real events. So that's like a, that's like a very semi autobiographical movie, and it's, it's sad. Yeah, that's my understanding. But it, it's a good sad movie. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's another one. It's not very oh. fan. That's not fantasy at all. Yeah. So this is like Takahata's like wheelhouse is keeping things more grounded rather yeah, than dealing and not with the, fantasy. The, the fan yeah the fantasy side which Miyazaki um thrives in this is also based off of a manga um I don't think it's I don't think it was an ongoing series I think it was just you know as you know a little bit of a, like a, a short, short story yeah or a story uh manga by Hotaru Okamoto and Yuko Tone um what I thought was interesting about this is that the manga has none of the adult woman parts at mm. all. It's just a series of vignettes of this girl from like 1966 hmm. or, or of that age. Okay. And then Takahata adapted that and added the adult version of her as sort of like a way to weave in and out of these vignettes Yeah. and kind of like tie it into like a greater, you know, um, almost like a quarter life crisis type of a story like again coming of age is probably yeah, the coming better, of age, exactly better way to what this is yeah it's... like she's finally finding herself yes or finding herself for the second time 
and I think because of that, okay, so we have the source material of the manga, and then we have this original part. Um, the animation style is also very subtle to me. Mm-hmm. Like, when you first get into it, it's mostly the flashback stuff. There's not a whole lot of present day, and that gets um, more and more uh, present as the movie goes on. It becomes, like, more yeah, 1982 present, and yeah. less 1966. It kind of switches gears. Mm-hmm. But in the beginning, uh, the animation seems relatively basic. It's It was a little bit tough for me to tell some of the school kids apart because their character models were very similar to me. Um, and... Also, like, the, the the drawings and the backgrounds were, were beautiful, but also very basic. And I, I think the reason why is it hit me sort of, like, halfway through. What I notice is that the flashbacks are told where you have, you have a more simplistic drawing style on purpose. And all of the backgrounds are done in basically, like, this watercolor style. Yeah. And, like, you probably notice, too, where it just fades into white, so you have, like... It looks like a sort of like a mostly painted page on the screen. Yeah, kind so you of have like, like white around the, the corners in some areas. Like a comic book page would be. Somewhat, yeah. So you have like this color fading into nothing. Mm. Um, but then when you look at the present day. Yeah, it's all color. It's color. It's not all watercolor. It's like more oil painting. There's tons more detail. Oh, yeah. Uh, not only in the character models and the facial facial expressions, but also just in the scenery. And it took me a little bit of time to realize that that's what was happening. But it was I basically like maybe... she was remembering a children's book it's... version of her life. Yeah, it's kind of like when people think in a comic book, it's like that cloud. Mm-hmm. Like this was the cloudy yeah. version yeah going to the past because i even even the cover of this the one that i've seen it's got that basic the white Mm -hmm. like it's kind of faded and then you see her older self with her younger self on the cover of yeah exactly like the dvd (laughs) or the vhs i don't want to say vhs yeah there is no vhs copy at least not in english language um release there, I'm sure there was VHS versions in Japan, um, but not in our region. Yeah, it's where this this movie is only available through HBO Max as an English dub. We should probably mention that we watched the English dub because that's all that was available to us through HBO Max. Yeah. Um, or as a DVD slash Blu-ray combo pack. That's the only way you can get this, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah, because I know that we like watching movies in the original language. Yeah, and, then... and also I just wish, you know, there would be like a digital rental version for people who don't have HBO Max. That would be nice, too. Right, and yeah, I wish there was an option to either watch it dubbed or mm-hmm. subtitled. Yeah, dubbed or sub. I, I think we got lucky, though, with the, the dub. Right. Um, it's also a very unusual situation with the dub, uh, because <laughs> when this was brought over domestically, it was given a, well, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, when, when Turner Classic brought it over, they did the subtitled version. So when the dub came over in 2016, they got basically an all-star cast of voice actors with a couple of larger names to play the larger parts. So you right. have, um, Daisy Ridley is the main adult Tycho, putting on uh, an American accent. Yeah, this is... I was confused by this, because she... Okay, Daisy Ridley is British. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, D- Dev Patel is the other one. He's, he's like, the main guy. Yeah, the main... <laughs> possible love interest, Toshio. Yeah. He's the second cousin who comes and picks her up and, and he's, like, the but, farmhand that she has the most interactions with. Yeah, and Dev Patel uses his British accent yes. for this guy. So I was, like, that's where I was also confused. I'm like, oh, so he's using his British accent, but she's not? Yeah. And I, I'm and assuming... And I was wondering why. 
but yeah, I don't know. they're probably trying to comment on class in some way with that. Or Cause, yeah, country he does, versus city. He does you know? say, yeah, I'm a peasant. and I li-. When they do yes. meet, when he comes and picks her up at the train station, and then he's driving her to where she's going to stay, he's listening to... He does not listen to tr- traditional like Japanese music. No, he's listening to Hungarian. Yeah. Uh, and he's Zamfir. like, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, she comments on that, and he's like, "Well, I'm a peasant." Like, he he kind of jokes, and he's like, "Well, you know, peasants listen to this type of music." Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like folksy and to the earth, and evidently that's what the British accent was representing, perhaps. Um, uh, yeah, or, or the, that's yeah. where it was, I mean, unless, you know, because Daisy Ridley was just so well known because of Star Wars and they're like, oh, she's got to have this American accent. Yeah, I don't know if known. that would be a reason for that because normally they want you to recognize their voices to kind of draw I did, you in. But... I did not. I mean, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if know I would have recognized Daisy her voice. Ridley. <laughs> I didn't recognize Dev Patel's voice either, because he doesn't really have a distinctive voice. Right. You know, he just has a very typical, like, British man's voice. Yeah. I don't know. There's nothing unusual about it. You can't, like, I don't know. How many people could do, like, a Dev Patel impersonation? You know? <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs> so, from that standpoint, it's, it's you know, you got good actors to portray these these parts. Yeah. Then you have Alison Fernandez, who is the young version of Tycho, um, who is in Logan. Uh, she was like the little girl of Logan. She was also in Once Upon a Time. Um, what's really interesting about this is that Daisy Ridley was born in 1992. So, so we have our first even... movie <laughs> starring someone who was not born during the year that we're covering. Well, I mean, the little, only. the little girl, Alison Fernandez, yes, she's 2005, 2005, so. 2005, Dev Patel, 1990. So we have a one-year-old and a negative one. and uh, When this movie was originally yes. aired, yes. Yeah. Just fascinating to me that that's <laughs> a thing that can happen. So, um, And then, yeah, the rest of the cast is just like voice actor all-stars, just like nonstop, like huge names, like. Hope Levy and Greg Griffin and Tara Strong and, you know, people who have done dozens and dozens of things. And yeah. what I thought was really interesting with Daisy Ridley is like she had, almost had like an ASMR quality to her voice. She was very soft spoken most of the time. Yeah, because she sounds older than what she should have been. Yeah, older than what she's trying to portray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not like an old woman, but just like a mature woman yeah <laughs> i don't know <laughs> and maybe that was i don't know maybe that I was mean, more if that was in meant the, to be that way it could be like if the narration aspects were supposed to be her looking back at things as a much older version of herself that we so never got to meet an older Tycho was narrating this like a 45 year old Tycho was narrating this not a 27 year old Tycho Maybe. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't remember her being so quiet and, and reserved when she was talking to Toshio, you know? Yeah. But anytime there was narration, it was very, you know, quiet and it's like, and then I remembered at this time, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. Maybe it was her trying to put on like, like telling an a older... story mm-hmm. to her children or something. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, speaking of that, there's evidently talk of doing some sort of a live action adaptation of this where there would be like a grandmother version of Tycho. Uh-huh. And then, so you'd have and like the daughter. three generations uh, as a live action thing. So. I don't know if I would want it live action. Yeah, I don't know either. If they do do like a remake, or not a remake, I guess a sequel. Yeah, I don't know how they would phrase it. It would probably be a remake. It would probably be like a reboot type of a deal. So, I mean, it could work because, you know, like I said, the manga did not have 27-year-old Taiko in it, and this was still fantastic. So, yeah, anything's possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a 
couple key scenes. I don't want to give too much away. I know we typically kind of go through the plot a whole lot by, and sort of like go through each individual beat, but I kind of don't want to do that in this. I don't want to give a whole lot away, even though, I mean, it's, it's not, not like there's a lot of secrets in there. It's just like, it's better if you experience some of the flashbacks on your own, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, because I didn't really know much about this movie, except for, I mean, I had a couple friends who've seen it and they're like yeah it's about a couple of girls talking about their periods <laughs> <laughs> and i was like oh okay <laughs> but and then, but it wasn't that the whole movie no <laughs> it was just like one part it's a significant that. part yeah and, and not necessarily a sig- I mean, can... <laughs> significant amount of time but it's a significant part i mean that part was amusing <laughs> and i believe if if what i you know if i what i read is true that is also most likely the very reason that this did not hit theaters until 2016. Oh, because of the because of the menstruation talk, specifically, That's which weird. I think is fantastic, fantastically ironic. So, um, Disney arranged a deal with Studio Ghibli back in the day. Mm. Um, Disney refused to show the movie because of the menstruation talk, because huh. there was mention of periods and things yeah, like yeah. that. Studio Ghibli had it as part of their contract that Disney could not alter those scenes. Probably not just for this movie, but also like other movies, they had like a contract that said you cannot change the, you know, the content of our scenes. And so as a result, Disney just shelved it. And then until another company came through, got the rights. And that's why like Studio Ghibli stuff is on HBO Max instead of Disney Plus. And so, like, they got the rights, they localized it, got the dub, pushed it out the door. Ah, uh, okay. So. I mean, I think that's stupid. That, I mean, It's whatever. really stupid, especially since the main thread of that menstruation sequence is it's nothing to be ashamed about. Mm, right? Like, it, you know what I mean? Because, like, I mean, that like, That's one of back, the main things that they yeah. say over and over again is, like, yeah. there's nothing to be ashamed about getting your period. It's very natural. Disney shut it down. Cannot talk. No, because women are al- D- Disney characters don't menstruate mm. at all. Mm-mm. Princesses don't. Mm-mm. I mean, this isn't about a princess. It's it's about an, a normal girl. Yeah. But I mean that yeah that whole scene and that did that took me back to middle school. Like even when she was going back to middle school days, I'm like I remember all this like bullying, being made fun of, all of that. And then the that. whole, you know, when around fifth grade, yeah, that's when, you know, like boys and girls are hitting puberty. And, and then it, yeah, it starting becomes. Yeah, to learn about sexual education. Yeah. Yep. And it does start where in one of her flashbacks, you know, one of the, her classmates is making fun of her because a boy likes her, and then everyone's mm-hmm. teasing her because oh, so and so likes you, and and then how like embarrassed you are because like oh, that person likes you, and then like and then everyone's looking at you, and then they're looking at the boy that likes you, and it's <laughs> so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah, I didn't have that particular experience. The whole thing with like talking about getting their periods and how like yeah the girls would get teased and the boys were like oh you got your period you're gonna you touched me and you're gonna give me your period yeah like that type of stuff that stuff yeah don't touch the ball i don't want to catch your period yeah Yeah. like that's true to life oh yeah yeah (laughs) absolutely (laughs) so i mean whoever wrote that is like i don't know i'm glad they wrote that yeah (laughs) yeah It, it, everything, even even though it's the perspective of a younger girl and and a you know older girl, like it's still incredibly relatable to anybody. Oh yeah, it's just pure pure nostalgia. Even if you didn't have that exact experience in that same country, it's still like you know. Yeah, same, it just makes you think like the this same happens around the world. Mm-hmm. It's not just you. Definitely. Everyone goes through this. Yeah, so it centers a lot around, like, embarrassment and, you know, not sure how to react. And, like, that scene where the dad brings back the pineapple is another good example of that. So, um, 
again, this is like 1966 in Japan, and, you know, pineapples are not, you know, part of that region. the region. Yeah. And so he brings back a pineapple at Tycho's request. Uh, they don't know how to eat it. They don't yeah. know how to cut it up. It's like it's like this humorous scene. But then when they finally get to it, like it becomes like this big event, and then like nobody likes it. And they're just like, eh. like this doesn't taste like the canned stuff. I don't like it. But then Tycho's like, it's good. Like she's having like, like she's take responsibility. To like it, yeah. And, yeah, because she was and the like, reason. Okay, well you can eat my this. piece because I don't care yeah. for it. Yeah. And she's like trying to force herself to eat more because she. She made this happen. It's her fault. And so she's taking yeah, responsibility and trying to force herself to It was because of her like that they all had to eat this pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we can't relate to someone bringing home an exotic fruit, like, we can still relate to that whole concept of... Like, you know, oh, well, oh, this Tycho is, wanted... This is on me. I need yeah. to... Like, I, I understand this feeling of, like, shame and whatever that isn't relevant like nobody's gonna remember this except for me mm-hmm. type of a shame we've all had that yeah where the mom is like obviously disappointed at you for doing whatever like subtle annoyance at you just existing in certain ways mm-hmm. that you think are normal but aren't to her you know like we've all had those types of experiences with authority figures i'm sure so it's just that type of thing over and over again Uh, mixed in with her at the farm where she definitely seems to have everything all together like mentally until near the end (laughs) where things start to fall apart a bit more Um, and she's having like these conversations with Toshio and like they go to that mountain Mount Zhao Zhao, Mm -hmm. I think it is is like a side trip and then they have to have like discussions about like why is it abnormal for me to be single at 27? Like, why is that such a weird thing? And then they get into this weird conversation about, like, multiplication and division and how that relates to your life experiences. And she starts to, you know... Yeah, go back to, try like, to reveal her... How she doesn't past. have everything figured out because of, you know, this reason or whatever. Um, and then she seems to have something of a mental breakdown at the end, obviously. Well, not obviously a mental breakdown. But, um, it's, yeah, what you said before. Kind it's of a like rumination. A, yeah, like a core life crisis. She's like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Like, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> like, yeah, she's it, just it's... driving or walking al- alone, and she's seeing past children from her life. Yeah, she and sees she this kid, Abe. Like, yeah. yeah. Who is, um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't, I don't know if I want to get into that whole sequence as to what happens with Abe exactly, but I think what leads up to it is she's asked to stay at the farm. Yeah, that but, scene was awkward. Yes. Because they're talking about her right in front of her. Yes. And, and like, I was like, why are you having this conversation? Like, all, this whole family is making decisions for her while she's sitting there just, like, minding her own business, trying to, like, do stuff with these safflower harvest or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Like, she's sitting there working, and they're like, why doesn't Tycho just stay here, marry Toshio, and have a life here with us and be happy? And then she's two feet away just working, obviously listening. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because they're half of it's it's directed at her. So yeah, like this, yeah, this grandmother character is like, like basically telling her, "You should stay. You should yeah. you should stay and do this." And then they all start to have conversations as if she's not there, um, while the grandma is still like pointedly talking to her. And meanwhile, yeah, just uh, great direction and, and animated acting. Yeah, right? yeah. Because there's no verbal information coming from Tycho. It's just all body language. And yeah, she's, she's just drawn, sitting there just looking still down. trying to work. She stops mm-hmm. working. She's looking down. She's thinking. And then they're like, Tycho... Then they're finally like, Tycho, what do you say for yourself? She just gets Basically. up and walks away. Yeah. And I think that's... You know, it's such a key part where she's like... Like all this pressure like with within herself and then these people are also pressuring her and she's just like i'm gonna have a breakdown (laughs) yeah it's it's, it's this it's this big conflict of what she wants out of life versus 
I don't want to give in to p- these people who are trying to make decisions for me. Yeah, like, don't tell me what to do with my life. Right, like, she very well could have done that on her own. Yeah. But the fact that they're coming to her and pressuring her is making her want to run away. Yeah. So, um, that's, like, the big climax, and it's, like, right at the end of the movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and I think it resolved basically perfectly (laughs) there is a there is little areas that are great to talk about i mean it's it seems like when she's struggling with wanting to make her own decisions this entire movie and then you know when she's younger you know she's not very good at math but Mm -hmm. she's very good in like the arts basically Mm mm-hmm and everyone in her family thinks she's, like, the odd one out. Because, you know, her sisters are like, why don't you understand math? Like, this is easy. Yeah. Like, how come you can't multiply or divide? Yeah, and she and has, like, her own methods that, like, she's not allowed to pursue. Cause she's like, you know, she's making charts and graphs. It's like, well, if I have this many yeah, apples and I divide she, this she's apples. She's like a visual like learner, yeah. which, and they're like, no, no, no. Why, why can't you just do it this way? Like how the rest of us do it. And yeah. she's like, I can't comprehend that. And like, you know, frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of interesting scenes like that. Between um, her and her family. Just... And obviously the whole like acting thing too. Um, where she's in a school play and, uh, you know, she's only has one line, but she does everything she can possibly can to like, make yeah, she kind of, she makes her own, she kind of improvs and makes up more dialogue for herself, even though she had like a one sentence thing to say. Yeah. And then the teacher's like, no, just say whatever is on the script <laughs> and that's it. But then during that play, she adds a little more. Mm-hmm. But some like scout or something was there, like yeah, talent yeah. scout. Yeah, was I there. thought that was kind of like a weird tall tale type of thing. Yeah, but evidently, I don't know. I mean, it's to all see fictional. a child's play, but yeah, right. yeah, to recruit her for some sort of like a local college theater production. They were at this production and wanted her to be in it. Right. Dad said no. Um. But around that time, too, like, they added this other element of it, of, like, her watching TV. Mm Mm-hmm. And... Like, singing along and playing along. Yeah, I think if we understood... I I think if we were of that era or knew more about Japanese pop culture, that it might have a bit more impact on us. Um, Because as far as I know, those are real shows that they're representing. Yeah. In there, like, real puppet shows or real animated things. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. but they didn't translate the songs that they're singing. No. Um, so those were still in Japanese. And I think if we had that context, that maybe some of that information would help us with those scenes even more. I don't know. But it was still like really, I always love it when there's like animation within animation. You know, like how they yeah. switch styles up to, you know, show this cartoon is watching a cartoon and how they, <laughs> yeah. how they interpret that or this cartoon is watching like a puppet show. Like it's, I don't know, that's always fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And it gets into like a little bit of a fantastical sequence at that point because occasionally like she'll float through the clouds or she'll have like rainbow sprouting yeah. behind her yeah, those as she's cute like little singing along the, the song. Or it's like, I got new shoes and it's like this whole, she jumps in the air and it's like stop motion Mm -hmm. they show they like focus on the shoes and then like she and then she lands back to ground and it's like back to doing whatever yeah (laughs) yeah it's just cute and charming yes (laughs) um any other sequences that we want to talk about anything else i mean the ending i don't know if you want to give away the ending sure go for it (laughs) I mean, because you don't really want to give away anything else. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, we talked about, like, I think the best way to go about it is, like, just talk about, like, at least in terms of, like, the flashback sequences, like, talk about, like, the general themes, but maybe not talk about the specifics. Yeah. Because that's what's most important, but it's still worth watching for the specifics, so. Um, but, yeah, so, like, the whole Abe story, like, that's very 
interesting and critical, and I don't want to give that away. Yeah, I mean, there, she tells so many tiny stories about her life throughout this movie. We're just talking about the major ones. Yeah. And even then, you know, even within the movie, she's like, well, why am I being revisited by this fifth grade version of myself? What am, What is it trying to tell me? And it kind of takes you like the entire length of the movie to even start to figure it out. You know, like, but mm. the whole time you are also trying to figure it out yourself. It's like, like, what is the actual connection? What is, you know, why, why this sequence? Why that sequence? Uh-huh. Why then? And yeah. But anyway, yeah. The ending. <laughs> Well, yeah, af- well, after that awkward conversation with those the family, mm-hmm. you know, she runs off. It's raining. Toshio, who we didn't really talk too much about, but I mean, she she's telling these stories to him, and they're kind of bonding a lot. You know, that family sees that, and that's why they're like, "Why don't you just marry him?" Because uh-huh. you guys get along. Uh-huh. And, and they, you like the farm. You, yeah, you like the farm. But they're not like... They're not like flirting, right. you know? They're right. just being friendly with each other because she's there and he's kind of like her like chauffeur. Because whenever she needs to go somewhere or do anything, he's the driver. Uh-huh. Or, and he's also kind of like her tour guide for that entire farmland area. Yeah. And they, they're just talking, like, nor- like getting to know each other and talking and being friendly. And, um, I, I mean, you know, after that awkward <laughs> conversation, she runs off, it's raining, he comes and gets her, and then something, like, she, I don't know, it's like everything comes at her all at once, and she's like, do I like this guy? <laughs> Because then she also, she has like a fantasy of her in the future with him on the farm. Mm -hmm. While he's driving her back to the house, he's thinking of her and him, you know, laying on like um, a stack of hay or something. Yeah, like them working farming the farming together. and working yeah. together they're like laying on a sack of hay like being happy together and mm-hmm. she's like is this what i really want right and then you know the next day that's when she leaves to go home the entire family takes her to the train station she gets on the train to go home and then once again you know her younger self appears but then it's like her entire fifth grade class appears and is on that train and it's like all these feelings come up and she at the next stop she gets off goes back on the train going back to the farm town she was yeah she, she originally yeah. stayed at she switches sta- she stri- yeah. yeah she switches trains and goes back switches directions at the station yeah. yeah and then you know all the all and then you know her younger self and then all the fifth grade all her fifth grade friends are like following her along on this train back. And then, you know, (laughs) I thought, and then she, she gets back to the train station. She calls these people up Mm -hmm. and then I was like, they're already home. (laughs) Cause I mean, I don't know how long that train ride. Yeah, who knows how long that first station was. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. A couple hours. Who knows? I don't know. She calls them back up and then they're like, Oh, like, I mean, this isn't, no one this is all there's no dialogue there's no dialogue it's over a song which is a japanese version of the rose yes song by bet midler so that song is playing and you know they're all happy that she came back but then that's how it ends Mm -hmm. she comes back but you realize that that's she goes back and stays there and it's like intended that she's gonna stay there and get married to Toshio. Yeah. And, you know, start this life of farming with him. And I really love that basically double ending yeah. type of a thing where I know it's almost impossible to do this considering that, like, it never fades to black, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it just starts rolling to credits when, like, this old man, like, pushes his way through the, the, through the door and, like, sits down and starts fanning himself on the train and, like, the credits roll. Mm-hmm. But, like, if you're, like, one of those types of people who bolts for the exit as soon as the credits start to roll, 
you would miss that. Yeah. And you would still have what could be considered a satisfying ending. And then you have like sure, the secondary yeah. <laughs> ending if you stay for the entire credit. So it's kind of like interesting that there's mm-hmm. the dual option there for you. But stay for the end. That's the better ending. Um, the only other thing I can think of that might be worth talking about that we haven't talked about is just that for a 1991 movie, they really lecture about like organic farming. <laughs> you oh know, like, yeah, it's really interesting they to talk, see like, like so much that... discussion about nature and organic well, farming. That's what I, like, I was thinking. That's what I was thinking about. Like, was farming like really like were there not enough farmers? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe in the nineties in Japan, I don't know. I don't know. Like, although because they were saying, I mean. When Toshio is showing her around, they're like, this is what the farmers, they created these streams. They created yeah. the, like... It's like, you form- see this as nature, but I see this as something that's been that touched by far- man. Yeah, a, a farmers man created built all this. Of this. This yeah. is all man-made. Like, all this beauty is man-made. It yeah. wasn't created, like, organically, I guess. I don't know. But, yeah, I guess, like, even, you know, because the farm that they work on is, like, organic, no pesticides, whatever. I wonder if that, you're thinking on it just now, like, right now because this was from like 2016 and it was the english dub Mm. maybe that type of messaging was kind of like wedged in as part of the translation adaptation process oh you know like i'm sure a lot of that dialogue about you know what you see as nature i see is like touched by man and farmers like Mm -hmm. farmers created this stream Mm -hmm. so that this could happen and so this could grow i'm sure that was in there but i'm talking like specifically about you know, we got to do organic farming and not do pesticides because yeah. that's healthier for life and environments. Oh, yeah. Like, that part might have been Added. a modern, yeah. like, wedge. Now I'm thinking about it. If like anybody's a, ever seen the original version or the, or the... that, you know, you should, you yeah. know, buy organically. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. If anybody's seen the, you know, the subtitled version, let us know. Yeah. Uh, casting crew that we haven't mentioned. I don't know if there's really much that we haven't mentioned. I just I could go through the credits for some of these voice actors if you really want me to, but um, I couldn't find a whole lot of information about the Japanese cast. A lot of them either did not work a whole lot after this movie, or did not work on anything that I recognized because it probably didn't come over here. Mm-hmm. But we have a couple of like major, you know, bigger names who went on to do larger things uh, like some one of the cast members the younger Tycho, uh, went on to do a couple other studio ghibli movies like the cat returns and whisper of the heart that was yoko hana played Tycho as a child um but yeah like in general not much to say about that and then we always talk about Dizzy, daisy ridley dev patel all the other ones by name so not much to talk about in terms of casting cameos this time um awards also really nothing to mention this didn't win any award not that i could see i I mean i'm going off of imdb they did have like a couple little things but no like major award things that i could find um and i don't know if any sort of japanese um, awards awards are listed Mm. on that site to begin with so yeah nothing so I guess it's time to move on to true crime of pop culture. I found something out when I was looking up when, when this movie was released, which was on a Saturday. It was July 20th, 1991. And I almost didn't want to talk about it because this is like such a lighthearted and great movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then switching to like a crime. But... I mean, I don't know. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it. So early in the morning, around 2 a.m. on July 19th, 1991, so the day before this movie was released, Mike Tyson invited Desiree Desiree Washington, who was Miss Black Rhode Island. This was in Indianapolis at the time, and there was a Miss Black America pageant that was going on during the summer. And... He invited her up to his room at the Canterbury Hotel. Tyson sent his limousine to get her to pick her up and take her to his hotel. 
is he told Washington that he forgot something at his hotel. I guess they were out together. And asked her to come up to his room while he retrieved something. And she, you know, came up with him. The next day, she checked into the emergency room at Methodist Hospital and reported that she had been raped. I should also do a trigger warning, content warning. Yes. For like the next couple of minutes if you want to skip. She she first told the police, then testified in court that Tyson laughed about it as she sobbed. Washington continued continues to be criticized for assuming it was safe to go to Tyson's room and for subsequently reporting the account to the police. And there was partial corroboration of Washington's story came via testimony from Tyson's chauffeur who confirmed that Desiree Washington's state of shock after the incident. And then further testimony came from the emergency room physician who examined Washington just 24 hours after this incident happened and confirmed that Washington's physical condition was consistent with rape. The trial took place in the Marion County Superior Court from January 26, 1992 to February 10th. And on February 10th, 1992, the jury returned a guilty verdict on one count of rape and two counts of criminal deviant conduct. One of Tyson's lawyers, Alan Dershowitz, who, like, (laughs) he's still well known now, filed an appeal which was denied. On March 26, 1992, Tyson was sentenced to six years in prison along with four years of probation. He was assigned to the Indiana Youth Center, which is the Plainfield Correctional Facility. He was um, 24 around this time. Okay. But they still sent him to this, quote, youth center. Hmm in April 1992 and he was released in March 95 so he served only three years sentence instead of you know the full six and due to his conviction with Desiree Washington Mike Tyson is required to register as a tier two sex offender under federal federal law is this before or after the Robin Gibbons this is after after okay and, uh, I, I mean, I got this information. I will give you the information to put on the website. I got this from the New York Daily News, the Indiana, Indianapolis Monthly, and then there was, like, a Washington Independent expose all about Desiree Washington, like, where she is now, and it's, she just doesn't want to be in the limelight, because no. even after that, she was ridiculed, like, well after that. And, yeah, this was after the Robin Givens things, because that happened in 88. Hmm. And then, yeah, Desiree Washington, she was on um, 2020 to talk about this. And I think even Robin Givens was also on 2020 to talk about Mike Tyson. Probably. Yeah, he rebounded. (sighs) Yeah. But she she has to stay in hiding, even though she did nothing wrong. Right, yeah. And, yeah, I didn't really want to talk about this. Because I was like, oh, this is such a good movie. And then, oh, I found this thing. So, uh, going on to more pop culture. The top U.S. song was EMF's Unbelievable. And then, obviously, in the U.K., Brian Adams. (laughs) Unstoppable. And then now I'm going on to what was on TV during this time, which it was a Saturday night. Usually, you know, we always talk about movies that are released on Friday night. So mm-hmm. we, always, we always talk about, you know, TGIF and stuff like that. On ABC, this show called The Young Writers. Have you heard of this show? It sounds vaguely familiar. But it's like a drama, right? Yeah, I mean, do you yeah. want to So I probably wouldn't guess. have watched it. <laughs> no, uh, it was I, it was probably like trying to latch on to the same type of demographic that got like 30-something. Mm, uh, this is a, a Western. <laughs> is 
It's a Western? Yeah, American. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was like Young Hollywood. No, no, no. Writers. Okay, never mind. Oh, you mean writers as in W-R-I? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, this is writer, R-I-D-E-R-S. Oh. The Young Writers. Wait, are you saying? No. This is at night, though. Yeah. Okay, then no, I don't know. Okay. Because remember, like, when we were talking about Pee Wee Herman, the, um, the cowboy show that, oh, that oh, replaced oh, okay. his show yeah. was, I, f- I already forget about it. It's on the website for that episode, uh, but uh, it's like something writers. Oh, okay. That's what you were thinking. So this is an American Western TV series. It was a fictionalized account of a group of young Pony Express writers, but some of whom were young versions of legendary figures based at the Sweetwater Station in Nebraska Territory during the years leading up to the American Civil War. How could it fail? I know. (laughs) So, you know, it had like Billy the Kid, Uh uh, Wild Bill Hickok, and stuff like that. So... (laughs) It had Stephen Baldwin as William F. Cody. Okay. And then Josh Brolin was uh, the wild... He played Wild Bill Hickok in this. And and then another well-known person is Melissa Leo. The other people, I am not 100. Billy the Kid was played by someone by the name of Ty Miller. Okay. He's been in a bunch of random TV shows, like Growing Pains. He was in Merrill's Place, but I can't... I don't know if he was in General Hospital. <laughs> and then recent, like, the most recent thing that I can see is that he was, like, in Nip Talk. Mm. So that was the first... First winner? Yeah, no, not first winner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, so this is, like, summer TV, so they're just, like, kind of... This yeah. is back when summer TV was throwaway time. Right. The, like, a lot of these shows something are will just stick like... Where we're just going to like air some garbage, and if people watch, then people watch. Yes. I mean, this show was on for three seasons. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so it stuck a little bit. Yeah. After that was a show... This is still ABC. So at 9 o'clock is this show called Undercover. Do you know that? Not just by the word undercover, no. I mean, there was, like, undercover blues, I think, at one point. Oh, so this is a drama... It's a live-action drama, kind of like a spy, secret agent Mm -hmm. type of show. I couldn't find too much about it. Moving on to CBS, at 8 to 9 were two episodes of The Hogan Family. Do you remember The Hogan Family? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That one I definitely know. Yeah, me too. Because it changed names. Yeah, I think it was called Val- Valerie, and then I think the Valerie Bertinelli show, or Valerie Harper, I should say, not Valerie Bertinelli. And then, yeah, the... Um... And then Jason Bateman was one of her sons. Mm-hmm. That's and then Sandy Duncan came in, I think, to replace Valerie. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And after that was The Love Boat. I didn't know that was still on back then. Was that like a special or something? It was a repeat, but it was a repeat from an episode from 1990. So, wow. like a year okay. beforehand. And Fox was two episodes of Cops. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like the, probably near the beginning of that. Right, yeah. And then we have, after that, at 9 p.m. was Totally Hidden Video, which, you know, a prank show. Mm-hmm. After that, at 9.30, was a show called Babes. Have you heard of this show? Is that like studs, but like opposite? No, this is, a, a this, is, this is a sitcom. Oh. Man. I wish it was like studs. Studs was good. <laughs> <laughs> was I mean, they didn't really have dating shows studs and, like this yeah. in the early 90s. But this def- like this lineup sounds very Fox. <laughs> it's like... Here's this cop reality show, and then, and then here's yeah, here's some pranks, babes, and here's some pranks. But this show, I don't know why this was on after cops and a prank show. It was a sitcom series that follows a trio of overweight sisters facing the challenges of work, relationships, popularity, and starting a family. Family. Mm. The ladies share a small one-bedroom apartment in New York, which added to the comic friction. And it had, it had, I sort of remember this because yeah, it, it sounds slightly, slightly familiar. As soon as you said the three overweight, that actually 
yeah. triggered me like a like a poster or something like that. It, this had Wendy Jo Sperber in it, the sister in Back to the Future. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That I remember her. Huh. But that's all I remember. And then I had Nedra Voles. She was like a... Do you know who Nedra Voles? Mm-mm. She's the older woman that's like... She's been in a bunch of stuff, different strokes, all in the family. She's on, like, Hollywood Squares. She's that old woman that has the big gray bun glasses. Okay. I'm sure if I saw the picture. Okay, yeah, yeah. She's, she's showing me a picture right now. <laughs> she, she's in it. Okay. And then moving on to NBC, 8 p.m., an episode of A... These are all repeats. Uh, an episode of Amen. I'm sure you know Amen. Yeah, yeah, I watched okay. Amen. Amen. And after that was a show called Down Home. Do you know this show? <laughs> that one doesn't sound as familiar, but I mean, if it was on after Amen and if it was a sitcom, I might have caught it. It's a sitcom. Oh, by the way, like for Babes, Dolly Parton was an executive producer for that show. Okay. And so for this, uh, so now for Down Home, Ted Danson was a co-producer for this show. Okay, interesting. It's about a New York City executive named Kate McCrory who returns to visit her hometown of Hadley Cove, Texas, a Gulf Coast fishing village, only to end up staying there to try and save her father Walt's bait and tackle shop from condominium developer Wade Prescott. Who is who is her ex boyfriend? Of course. <laughs> this was two seasons, so. Who's in it? Any names? The only name that I know is Getty Watanabe, who is Long Duck Dong. And he was not either of the leads. No, the lead is a woman by the name of Judith Ivy. I looked her up, and she was in a lot of Broadway. Okay. Her father was played by Ray Baker, who I don't know at all, but he is in a lot of random, not great movies like Chud and stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) So we recently got like a stack of TV guides from 1991. So we'll try, like I can, we can try to go through those. And if we find any images for these shows yeah. on there, we'll take pictures and show it on we'll the scan website. Them and put them on the website. Uh, after Down Home was The Golden Girls. I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> after The Golden Girls was Empty Nest, which I used to watch yep. too, which is, you know, a spinoff. Mm-hmm. After Empty Nest was Dear John, which I used to watch. Mm-hmm. And after Dear John was Carol and Company. Did you ever watch Carol and Company? Do you know what Carol and Company is? I don't know if I would have. I mean, I, it this sounds was like, like it'd be like right up my alley, but I don't think I would have watched it too much for whatever reason. It's it Carol was on Burnett, at like right? yeah, it's it was on at ten thirty at night on That's, Saturdays, so it was pro- it was like competing with like SNL. Yeah. I knew of Carol I don't think Burnett. I've seen I appreciated this. her at the time, but I wouldn't have had as deep of an appreciation. I've never seen this, and then I went on YouTube, and there are some episodes, so I was like, let's watch some. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, a, you know, a comedy anthology TV series. It started Carol Burnett, had Jeremy Piven, hmm. Megan Fay, hmm. Terry Kaiser, okay. Anita Barone, Richard Kind, hmm. and Peter Croza. So I'm, Does he have, like, a comedy background? I guess. I mean, he is... I mean, he's in comedies. Yeah. But he's also not, you know? Like, right. He's in, what, I 911 just... right now? He's <laughs> right. Like under. That's, That's not a comedy. I was like, where is uh, Peter Crow is in nowadays? And I was like, oh, he's on that he's 911. He's on 911. He's always on these... Well, after Six Feet Under and, you know, after, like, Parenthood. He's been on these, oh, like... Oh, yeah, he's in Parenthood, too. But he was on, he's on these, like, very dramatic tv shows yeah I'm so yeah if he has like an improv background or something oh uh, yeah we can look up peter cruz <laughs> <laughs> but that was his first like tv appearance huh, that sounds interesting we could yeah we should yeah we, we can watch some watch episodes episode. of that so i thought that was the most interesting out of looking at this tv lineup yeah yeah i don't think i ever saw it on to rankings and ratings then 
So on your one to five star scale, where would you put only yesterday? This is going to be my first five. Your first, first five. My first, first five. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's, a, it, it's my second four star on my zero to four star scale. Uh-huh. So um, I think we both know the answer to this. Every movie's worth watching once. Would you watch it again? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll watch it. Absolutely. Uh, especially if we could... Like, if the... it was in the theater, I would definitely... Like, if they do, like, a Studio Ghibli thing... I know sometimes some, like, AMC, they mm-hmm. do those Ghibli... Studio Ghibli... Like, yeah, uh... they do, like, a retrospective yeah. or marathon or something. I would, I would want to see this in the theater, and then I would want to see the original, if yep. they had it. Subtitled. Yeah. yeah. I would definitely watch it subtitled, but even without... I think it's definitely worth watching more than once. And if you out there want to watch only yesterday, as of this recording in June 2021, as we mentioned, it's only available on HBO Max or as a DVD slash Blu-ray combo pack. Uh, But as always, check your local listings because that could change at some point in the future. As for us, you can listen to us on all of your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Letterboxd. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of 800 movies uh, along with show notes and more, possibly some TV guide scans. Uh, Next week, since it's baseball season, we're going to be watching Talent for the Game. That's available on Prime, digital rental, VHS, DVD. We'll see you then. Thanks.